From the creator of Pandemic, a cooperative game about saving the world from a deadly virus outbreak, comes another cooperative game about saving the world from an equally deadly virus of humanity, or anthropogenic climate change. Daybreak is Matt Laycock's newest creation, and it's every bit as tense as Pandemic. It also draws heavy inspiration from terraforming Mars, and if you liked that, I think you'll enjoy this too, but it's a co-op game rather than competitive. First though, a content warning. This review is going to be a very sensitive topic for a lot of people, I think. If you're already just fuming because I said climate change was anthropogenic uh, and not part of a natural cycle, I'm talking to you. Please turn off now. I don't want this review to offend your views of the world or opinion of me. And at this point, it's not worth arguing. Tune back in next time for robots and minis and zombies, etc. But let's be clear, this is a game. It's not a roadmap to actually solving the unsolvable. I did say that. It's a fantastic educational tool, and most of the time it feels hopeful. If only we'd done it this way. If only we'd work together more. The science, as far as I can tell, is accurate in as much as it can be when abstracted to a board game. Obviously, the topic is incredibly complex. I don't know how many board games there have been about climate change, but let's just say this is probably the best one ever. So one thing I really like is that you can scan the QR code on any of the cards to learn about real-world policy examples and a more thorough explanation of how that card works mechanically in the game, which is a really neat feature. But Daybreak is also in many ways a complete fantasy in a parallel universe where nations actually work together and agree on something. Still, it's good to have hope, isn't it? What is Daybreak and how do you play? For one to four players, Daybreak is a fully cooperative card game played over a series of six rounds where each player will attempt to green up their power infrastructure, remove dirty emissions and build resilience to protect them from the coming crises. At the end of each round, emissions will be counted up, countered by forests, oceans and possibly direct air capture, then anything left will contribute to average temperature rise. You'll also face an increasing number of unpredictable tipping points from desertification, deforestation, polar ice melt-off and a series of crises such as the rise of an eco-fascist government or fossil fuel lobbying efforts. The core of gameplay though is centered around building stacks of cards to represent various projects. You have five project slots and each player has a set of starting actions, then each turn you'll play other cards in one of three ways. Either discard a card to take an action where indicated, such as discard one card to build one clean energy plant. Or by replacing a project with another, placing the card on top, this stacks on front of the card. Alternatively, you can tuck the card behind another at the back of the stack to potentially strengthen the current project. Each card has certain symbols on it, such as a sapling for rewilding or forestation type projects, or a finance one for one involving money. And many of the actions become more powerful the more of these symbols you have in its action stack. So on this one, for example, if you have three to four saplings, you can make one wetland. If you have five or more, you can make two. So dual layer player boards represent your current power demand, which is sort of equivalent to population, but it's not just population. Uh, I should make that clear. But every turn, naturally, that increases uh, as a population grows, and you have to ensure that you're meeting the energy demands uh, that you currently have, either through green or dirty power. Underneath that, you then have a representation of current emissions, things like from factory, transportation, uh, and your power grid. On the bottom, you then have three types of resilience. These are used to counter the harmful effects of any crisis, while on the right is a place to track how many of your communities are in crisis. So if you can't uh, counter a certain crisis, you will get these community in crisis tokens. As things get worse, you'll be drawing less cards, and if you ever hit a total of 12 communities in crisis, you lose and everyone loses because your society has completely collapsed. Now, the game is played over a series of six rounds, and if you haven't won by the end of six rounds, uh, or if you reach two degrees of warming, you lose. Game over. Everyone's dead. But what about winning? 
Winning in Daybreak is defined by having entered a state of drawdown. That means you're producing less carbon than the world itself is able to absorb each round. At that point, you flip the turn tracker over to mark drawdown, and if you survive the end of round crises, uh, you win. The game also includes a set of challenge cards once you've mastered the core game and want to make things a little bit trickier. These can be anything from new rules or restrictions to just horrid starting game states. So that's pretty much the game. What do I think of Daybreak? Firstly, I want to make a quick point that this is a fully cardboard and wooden game. There are no plastic components or tape anywhere. I think that's commendable and it's a shining example of how to make a game absolutely gorgeous without plastic. The components are amazing. But then there's also a debate that actually plasticizing components means they might last longer. Oh, you could sleeve them. Well, if you want to do that, that defeats the whole point. So let's not go any deeper into that here. I think plastics are a miraculous invention that if used responsibly can be a part of a sustainable society, which is why I have a shed full of Lego. But anyway, this game doesn't use any plastic. Also, another point I'd like to make is that there's an official how to play video and it's really good. It's not too long and it doesn't need to be because it's not that complex of a game, but it's something we see so rarely from games manufacturers. The video for Daybreak is polished, concise, and just really good. We watched it together and we were basically then set for our first game. It's only about five, 10 minutes long. I mean, we lost, but at least we had a solid grasp of how to play and why we lost. So on to gameplay. I've really enjoyed our games of Daybreak. We certainly haven't won every time, uh, even when we've played what I would say is pretty solidly. Just as in Pandemic, where an unfortunate series of events could lead to virus bombs taking out cities, occasionally you can just get really unlucky with unpredictable global event rolls, which in turn triggers tipping points, and all of a sudden there's no forests left, and it all seems kind of impossible because there's nothing to uh, draw down the carbon anymore. And that's kind of what the climate is like, and it really accurately represents how difficult it is to solve climate change. There's certainly no single way of winning. You have to combine multiple strategies and shift as time goes on. Perhaps you have a massive renewable energy campaign for a few turns, then you shift your attention to removing emissions. Moreover, you really need to work with other nations, building the ability to exchange cards and technology, building resilience for each other, dealing with each other's communities in crisis, with the wealthier nations especially being able to lend a hand to those less fortunate, because ultimately, as a team, you're only as strong as your weakest player, and if one nation collapses, you all lose. Quarterbacking in this game is kind of encouraged. Direct carbon capture and storage is, I found, hugely ineffective. See, it's realistic. Unless you have huge amounts of luck in developing the tech early on and getting the right cards to strengthen it, otherwise it is tremendously expensive and doesn't really do much. In terms of replayability, each player broadly represents major world powers of EU, US, China, plus the majority world, which is a more polite way of saying the global south or developing countries. And each has a unique starting condition, with the majority world, for instance, having huge amounts of emissions and a population that increases three times as fast as everyone else. So it's tough to keep up with energy demands for them, uh, as well as starting the game with some communities already in crisis. It's really not going well for them. Players also have a few unique starting cards uh, playing on their strengths. So there's a bit of replay value right there, right away in trying out the different countries and how to deal with their unique problems and strengths. It is a completely different uh, play experience. Then you have the challenge cards that I mentioned, which add another element of complexity to an already very tense and difficult game. And there's a whole deck of those which we haven't tried yet. The base game has been sufficient for now. But to put my cynical hat on for a second, I can't help but feel like Daybreak is the embodiment of hopium, the media cliche of any mention of climate change, which invariably outlines the absolutely dire reality, yet always ends with the sentence, but it's not too late. If only we could all come together now, we still have a chance to turn this around and limit warming to 1.5 degrees. In reality, if Daybreak wanted to actually reflect the current situation, we'd be starting out at round four of six with 1.5 degrees of warming already happening. Half of these tipping points already triggered and half of the cards ruled out for various economic reasons, while attempting to implement the rest would result in complete collapse. Anyway, 
And of course, it would also be more like a 30 player game with traitor mechanics too for nations that base their entire income on petrochemical extraction. Then the global conference that occurs at the start of every round would actually consist of arguing whether indeed the climate was actually changing. If it is, whether we're responsible for it. And if we are responsible for it, then should we be fixing it? And if we should be fixing it, then how do we fix it without actually changing anything at all? Then consequently, deciding that we should skip the action turn for that round and merely agree that yes, we should indeed think about this again in the next round. Also, this is going to sound a little silly given that I literally chose to pay money for this game, but playing it has made me realize that actually I want my games to be fantastical and an escape from reality. Not to be reminding me of all the reasons why solving climate change is monumentally difficult and that the world around us is rapidly collapsing. Yes, it's a great educational tool, but if you are already collapse aware, then I think it's probably best sticking to games about zombies and robots and goblins and spaceships. Still, GG everyone, I'll uh, see you in the next one.